Hey everybody, this is the uh, Storytelling in the World of Darkness Tips and Tricks panel. So if you're here for something else, uh, uh, I am Matt McElroy. I am the director of Drive Through RPG. Um, I'm also freelance for Onyx Path on Bear from the Masquerade, Hunter the Vigil, Dice the Sin Eaters, and Scion, and a couple of other things. I'm Dave Brookshaw, I'm the Mage the Awakening and Deviant the Developer. Um, I'm, I've written for almost everything. So this is going to require audience participation. So we want questions and uh, problems you've had at the table and crazy ideas, not too crazy. but. Um, We'll talk a little bit about games we've run and um, storyteller chapters that we've written or worked on, um, but this is going. This is a little bit more casual than some of our other panels where we're really presenting a lot of information. This is uh, us, talk, you guys, talking to us and us offering some of our own experiences in that regard. Um, and we also have Ian here, who is the Trinity developer. I'm the Trinity Continuum developer, and I'm also the community manager. So if you read our blog or if you uh, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, that's probably the main. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Why don't you start with whatever the game you ran most recently, and then I'll. Um, okay. Um, my. Yeah, the most recent game I ran, I can't talk about because it, it was playtest. But my, um, <laughs> but my, uh, essentially, since uh, since the first edition of Mage: The Ascension came out, I have had a maximum of a six-month gap. Hey, people have turned up. <laughs> okay. I've had a maximum of a. We can really get started. Yeah. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, hello, I'm Rose Bailey, uh, Onyx Path development producer, which means I coordinate the schedule and stuff like that. And I'm also the developer of Vampire the Rec. I am Neil Raymond Price, freelancer off fired and then off rehired, and I am the current Scion developer. We're working on fixing that last part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're not too sure about the hire. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I have always run Mage at one point or another. Um, uh, first Ascension, uh, now Awakening. I my my <laughs> Awakening chronicles are um, written up and put up on RPG Net. We hired him because he sounded like such a bad FSP. Seriously, we read his uh, we read his Awakening chronicles on RPG Net and we're like, this guy could contribute. Um, so it's one of the only two times that I'm aware of in White Wolf history where uh, someone was hired for telling us about the character. Well, the other one was. The other one. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> the other one was Rose. <laughs> right. um, Justin Achille uh, about my character. That means anything to um, my current game that I'm running is also a bit of a playtest. I'm developing the Geist Dark Era that takes place during the Roanoke Colony. So I'm currently running a, a game that takes place in that that's actually a crossover game between Hunter and Geist, um, which is interesting because we've got certain characters that want to follow the mythos of Hunter and others that want to do Geist, so I've had a lot of challenges at the table getting those characters to not kill each other. Um, <laughs> so we're basically just uh, talking a little bit about the games we've most currently run, and then we're going to force them to actually participate a lot. So. Uh, hilariously, I don't actually run a lot of storytelling games. Um, I am currently running a Legend of Five Rings game and a Gumshoe game. In the past, I have um, played in a mage game. I've run numerous Scion games. I have ran a Vampire the Requiem game the day that the first core book came out. Um, and I've played in so many campaigns over the years. I ran a Dark Age campaign. And so I'm kind of all over in terms of games and the entire industry. So. Um, you might, as you might imagine, I run a lot of vampire, much like Dave with Mage. Um, mostly for the uh, last two years when I run vampire, it's been specifically to playtest things from upcoming supplements. 
sort of got into that cycle with uh, with uh, working on second edition and have accelerated with it. Um, right now, I am uh, I am looking to gear up uh, play tests for some other stuff. Uh, my own creator own game, Cavaliers of Mars, for example. And uh, right now, I'm running Lasers and Feelings, which is uh, Star Trek teen comedy. So that's going to be exciting. <laughs> Is it fair to say that you two tend to run shorter chronicles? Like, uh, um, yeah, I tend to aim for between 6 and 12 sessions. Um, although I am in a Changeling game that's been running for four years now. Yeah, because it, it's one of the um, uh, w one of the things that I've I found talking to other developers and writers at, at Starting to Pass is um, there are different perceptions of uh, how long a chronicle should go on for. and different people, I'm sure, like, uh, when we get onto your games, um, some of you will mostly do one-offs or, like, five-story long things, and uh, other people specialise in massive multi-year epics, like, uh, I ran a Mage the Ascension game that lasted for seven years. So, uh, how many of you have been storytellers for World of Darkness previously? I was just trying to get a feel for if we had people hoping to storytell or people who are currently. How many of you are currently running a game? Good. Yeah, well, that's, that's, like I said, that, that definitely, we definitely want a lot of questions here. Um, I'm going to fire off a couple to get us started. And uh, so I'm going to start with Neil. So I can fire him. <laughs> but um, let's see, here, one of your more recent, whether it's been World of Darkness or like L5R, I mean, it, it can definitely apply either way. But what's been some of the more recent, um, where you had a conflict between two players at the table, and how did you deal with that? Um, I subscribe to the uh, theory kind of espoused, I, I heard it espoused, I've heard it espoused in multiple places, but I heard it espoused best by, of all people, John Wick in um, uh, his, his, his kind of um, blood opera game, uh, House of the Blooded, it, um, he fundamentally believes that tabletop gaming is a collaborative experience. It's an experience between players, experience between the storyteller, or the GM, or whomever, even especially in games that don't actually have a GM or storyteller. Um, he firmly believes, and I mostly subscribe to the idea that you shouldn't keep secrets from other players. If I and Dave are in the same game, and my character is working to undermine Dave's player, Dave himself as a player gets the most enjoyment out of watching my character slowly but surely fuck his character over without his character even being the wiser. So it's important when you're dealing with conflicts between characters to know that that's not necessarily a bad thing. And it's not necessarily an unwelcome thing. The more unwelcome thing I see is when it's not um, is when it's not consensual, and when it leads to a player and player conflict when they feel that it's fundamentally unfair. If you have some sort of trickster character, or you have a very self-serving character, uh, like in the Dark Ages, a character on the road of sin, the character on the, on the Dark Ages on the Dark Ages road of sin is always out for themselves, always going to do that. And the moment that their relationship with the other person is not worth the effort they're putting into it, they drop them like a hot potato, no matter what kind of trouble they're in. They're the archetypal big side of trouble, I'm gonna go the other way, if it's not worth it for me to make a stand yourself. So, again, what's really important to me is, um, and this is actually happening in my L5 Arts campaign right now, one character is slowly screwing over all the other players, making alliances with their enemies, slowly undermining them, humiliating them in court, and like sending them off on little adventures that cause them to have a lot of drama. But the players all love it because they find it so, so hilarious that this character is doing it and succeeding at, at brilliantly um, destroying the entire group and the entire group's dynamic. And it's going to lead in probably three or four sessions to uh, a massive drama with everyone dead like at the end of Hamlet and the characters are gonna love that. Because who doesn't love Hamlet? Um, uh, the players are going to love that. I'm sorry. The characters are, are going to be torn apart forever and first with the start. Yeah, that's a good survive. distinction to make there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it is vitally important that 
sponsor to be characters be consensual between the players, permitted, and for you not to keep any secrets, for it not to be a sudden surprise when it's thrown on them. And so, yeah, if my character has like a dark secret that he's keeping with the rest of the group, like, uh, yeah, he's actually, um, he's actually born of some enemy race and he's been hiding his identity this entire time, um, then, you know, I tell the other players, I tell the players right off, because they know every time my character reacts to something like that in the game, it's a ticking time bomb waiting to go off, and a big minor drop. Great. Um, Rose, this comes, probably comes up a lot in playtesting, but it, it applies during normal games as well. Um, what do you do when you have one player at the table that's not getting a particular rule that's vital to the game? How do you work with that player to understand that without derailing or stopping play for everybody at the table? Uh, well, actually, um, while I try not to waste time, usually I do stop play. If somebody doesn't understand something, okay. I usually do stop to clarify and uh, coach them through. Um, you know, sometimes that does get to be an issue with chewing up some time. But I think it's worth it because I don't believe in using a lot of rules I'm not going to use more than once. Great. Well, you've been doing a lot of testing lately. So. Uh, yeah, uh, when, well, because I've mostly been testing my own games, um, when somebody doesn't understand something I, uh, and we, um, and after reading the rule, uh, after reading the rule out, uh, we don't like it, and it tends to get edited. In the <laughs> <laughs> this is also true of my playtesting. Yeah. Uh, you can't figure out that rule. Maybe I should rewrite it. Yeah. Yeah. That 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 can happen. Maybe but it's useful um, for everyone else. But I do. But I, when it's not my game, as for, when I'm running vampire. Um, yeah, I stop. I, I stop playing and explain. If it's going to take forever to stop playing and explain, then I will tell them. Uh, I will ask them roughly what they're trying to do, handle it for them, and then uh, explain how it worked afterwards. Like, uh, I, I find um, uh, some of Exalted Second Edition subsystems were like that. Hard for the player to get. But Hard could, for the player to take, get. If but it took some yeah. time later, you could figure it out. Huh? Yeah. Um, let's go to questions. Over here first. Um, so my question has to deal with more of, uh, as a storyteller, I moved from one area where I was doing Red Wolf games, Werewolf, and Hunter, and I moved to an entirely different area, and moved out of state, and I'm trying to get people interested okay. in playing these games again. Now, of course, it seems like a lot of the, the Red Wolf books and everything are not as available to people, but I want to get... <laughs> well, um, it's just from where I'm at. It's like everyone's got Pathfinder, Pathfinder, for sure. It's like it's like okay, that's great. I want to play White Wolf. <laughs> yep. Um, how do you? How would you like present this to people to try and get them? Like, you would you come up with the story ahead of time, or just try and get them interested in the system first? Well, that's actually a great question. One of the things I do. Can you repeat for the reporter? Um, the qu the question is, um, when looking for new players, how do you? get people hooked or interested in the game. Um, one of the things I do is I, I, I treat it a little bit like I'm um, writing up a description for a convention. So yeah. like if I'm submitting a game to Gen Con, they require me to write a pitch, and then I explain how many players I'm looking for and what experience level. Um, and you really want to, your pitch should not be just prose. Mm -hmm. It should be, this is a game about X, and if you can, include a link because we've got a wiki and we've got quick starts and we've got other stuff like that. Um, what kind of resources are you using to promote that? Like, are you posting? Well, that was the thing. I hadn't really started trying other than just putting up a general description of the type of game I wanted to run and the kind of stuff that I go to and uh, give them my contact information. Well, that's uh, and, that, and that's just a basic thing, but I want to, like, it's been sitting up there for several months and I'm not getting any bites. So well, that's, that's one really resource. I mean, there's also Meetup. There's a lot of uh, Meetup.com has a lot of local groups. Okay. Um, Facebook. There are look for a group within your area or town. Uh, RPG Net game yes, gathering I have forum. Yes, I a lot of my uh, a lot of my players through RPG Net. Um, and then there's um, I think it's GameFinder. 
net, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Uh, Roll 20 not, has a, a classified section, too. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I'm, not just use, I'm not using it up, basically. Yeah, basically, <laughs> you try a variety of things, but you also have to make your pitch informative enough to people. That, uh, if you use Reddit and all, there's a subreddit just called LSD, looking for group. Okay. And yeah, there's people posting stuff there all the time. There's also a city based subreddit that is just from. From right outside of Dayton. So I'm sure you've got to be Yeah, there's yeah. yeah, people in Ohio. Yeah, if you go to the Dayton subreddit and you can say, hey, is there any gamers out there looking to play this game on the internet? Okay. Um, white. Hey, this is the person. Uh, I run a lot of games that have a lot of players, and I'm talking like 40 players in the account. So what I I generally have a large PC is to chasing because Imagine. <laughs> right because people they get sidetracked and they do side stories, and then my original uh, storyline. Um, kind of dies out if you want to finish it. So I guess my question would be, how do you keep chasing for such a large group? So I'm sorry, did you say 40 players? Yeah. Can I ask what the circumstances of that are? I'm just curious. Uh, I run track games. Ah. Oh. Okay. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. What I think the most ideal thing for you to do. Uh, would be if people are going off on their own little side adventures and their own little side things, don't fight it. And don't fight it, but channel it. See if you can if you can group together certain subplots and certain side plots that are adjacent to and hook into your main plot and try to target the various players who kind of go off and do that anyway. Try to target them into groups so they all kind of funnel in the groups. This is a big trick a lot of LARPs use. They'll have a main They'll have a main story, and then you'll have various side plots that are adjacent to and eventually funnel back into the main plot at certain points. So you like, try to identify players who will hook up together, and I know it's a lot of work, and that's why LARPs are a lot of work, but I mean, you, you get them in groups, and then you have the groups on the different side plots, and eventually you might have someone like hooking up from one group just randomly going over to another group, you know, you have this, this vampire city, and suddenly the werewolf is like, hey guys, let's, uh, let's all go up and uh, have some fun tonight. And the other guys are like, all right, whatever. Um, you're you're going to have that, and just don't fight it. Have those subplots of them to fall into and funnel, rather than going off and kind of doing their own thing. That keeps them invested, that keeps them focused, and that keeps them funneled back into the main thing. If it's just you jamming, that's going to be very tough, but you know, we've got 40 players, and you seem to be managing it kind of well, so I trust you. Just have a place for them to go, rather than just sort of funneling off while the main plot goes. Does that help? Yeah. One, one of the yeah. other things I would suggest is if, if you've got a couple of players that are really good at um, writing a little bit of narrative, have them do a recap for you. This is what happened to this session. And then keep that on a blog or a wiki or something so people can go back and see the parts that they missed. And then they'll want to come back to those storylines because my character was off doing this other thing, but this really cool thing was going on over here. Yeah. So that, I want to get back in on that. Deputize. De if you want to deputize a couple players to kind of like keep an eye on it for you and report back to what's going on, I mean, that's a good idea. I don't know if you keep a chat log, but you could have some, you could have somebody kind of go through that and do like a little narrative prose kind of highlight reel rather than just the whole log. You're kind of doing a little. You're kind of turning it into a little bit of fiction, yeah. but it's sort of recapping what happened that session. Yeah, we'll go start here and then here, and yeah. then we'll jump onto a different topic. I wanted to give you a trick. Uh, I ran a LARP uh, with some other things, 50 and 60 players for about two and a half years. Um, I let them fill in my story. So, like, for instance, if I had an encounter with the Sabbat written into my story at a certain point, and they ran off and fought a bunch of Anarchs or fought a bunch of other vampires, rather than me say, darn, how do I get them to go face the Sabbat again, I'd say. And they did that. And throw it away, let them navigate it. They're going to feel like they uncovered something on their own, and you just play out the encounter as if, uh, without ever having to force them to and that works in the tabletop just as easily. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great tactic. Uh, so we're also large storytellers. We spend 20 
almost 20 years of LARP, uh, as King. Um, and we generally give those small groups that we send off on side missions information about the main mission, but they get half a cookie, and they get half a cookie, and they get a quarter of a cookie, and you don't get the whole cookie unless they talk to each other. Mm -hmm. ah. When Elysium comes together, they're all talking to each other. Exactly, yeah. and we like using either, um, be it Cabal's, be it Motley's, be it Coteries, whichever, those generally are really natural, or orders, or uh, covenants, or whichever game you're playing. Um, those are really natural divisions to send a group off. So, because we're primarily made up these, we're usually like, all right, the latter are going off to do this. They can bring whoever else they want to come with them. The latter brings everyone with them. Because they yeah. are the diamonds and don't use the diamonds. <laughs> Always bring a couple of arrows. <laughs> All right, we're going to jump to you first and then come back to you. And then we'll come to you. Okay, so this is a problem that I've been having for uh, a pretty long time. Uh, but it's been getting a bit more noticeable lately because I'm also someone who runs long Ben games with Mage, and I've done my last couple of games starting on the Unity template. And the issue that I've been running into is that a lot of my games tend to scale up in scope deeply quickly, and especially with long games, especially with second ed experience, it gets a little difficult to keep the seats of the wise and old mage when we have teenagers looking at our plans. And I'm curious if you have any tips on how to do time and scope scale. Yeah. Um, in in Envod, uh, Awakening. Uh, or Ascension, because I had that problem in Ascension. I had a 16-year-old uh, character who turned into a master of the course of the game because of the way the experience system works. Um, if you're using second edition mechanics for NWOD, uh, the reason that a beat is not the same as an experience is for uh, is partly for that kind of adjustment where you can change the number of beats that go into an XP. Um, so you can make uh, character progression slower if you find that you're in your chronicles um, characters uh, grow up too fast. Um, I find that um, I found that um, the the progression of uh, mage characters over time is um, because the way arcane experience works um, your average mage has a higher notice than your average vampire will have blood potency and you Definitely just have to, and you just have to go with it um, if according to the legacy mechanics in first edition your chronicle if your characters are joining legacies there should be notice seven masters running around your setting for them to be the apprentices of and uh, where most well, where most end world games shy away from that kind of thing. In Awakening, you really have to roll with it. Um, as regards uh, keeping the mystique of wise old masters, there is, uh, there's always something that the players don't know. Uh, whether it's, uh, it's not necessarily people's arcanum ratings, uh, but it'll be uh, people's order status, uh, membership in weird legacies, uh, the ownership of strange artifacts. There, there will always be. Uh, you can. Um, you have to go away from the. You have to go away from the. How many forces dots does the character have in order to keep a uh, a storyteller character's mystique in that kind of way. And one of the uh, things uh, I'm not so much a mage SP, but one of the things I found useful in running higher power games in the NWOD is that there's a lot of stuff in the NWOD that just is a certain way. Um, it's a phenomenon that works one way, and it doesn't matter what your uh, what your dots are. This is still going to be weird um, because it's not something quantified in terms of the powers available to players. Um, off the top of my head, Midnight Rose is full of that stuff. Um, now, uh, there is sort of an issue which I would like to turn back to Dave here um, with scope uh, with scope creep, which is when you want to power up everything in your chronicle, what do you do when you run out of NPCs? 
Well, when I start a chronicle, I normally half generate about 150 of them. I'm the kind of guy who uh, designs every single mage in the concilium before I start a chronicle. But I run like four year, four year, five year long chronicles. So I have a spreadsheet <laughs> with, with my awakening campaign on it. So, um, for Masquerade, I dealt with a bunch of character scope creep as far as they gained experience, as they diabolized everyone in sight, <laughs> <laughs> as they lowered in generation. Um, and one of the things I do is a character that's becoming that powerful, they gain reputation. There's responsibility with being the most badass Bruja in the city. Other Bruja are going to look up to that character. Other people, them. But correct. Um, especially La Sombra, for example. Right. Um, and, and the thing is, if a character is going to ascend that quickly and become that, that well-known or that powerful or that, that much of a rank, that comes with responsibility, whether they want it or not. And you as an ST can use that. To be like, if you're suddenly going to throw your weight around and be the baddest Bruja in the city, there's going to be reactions to that. That's a really good point. And actually, in terms of mage, once it's gotten to the point where there are no more wise old masters who lord it over the player characters in the concilium, they should have apprentices. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, um, uh, if they are uh, if they've um, risen that rapidly in the orders, then they they should have students. Um, and uh, let them see how uh, let them see how the other half lives. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it actually one of my most uh, one of my most rewarding player experiences in the nation was was when I actually really fastly accelerated to that master point and I picked up an apprentice and I spent five six seven sessions just training that dude. <laughs> 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 he was the dumbest and just but no but once he finally actually picked up his objective I was like. I had not spent a single experience point in those years. It's even better if you manage to pick up a cheeky apprentice. <laughs> yeah. They go off and get into all sorts of trouble. I thought it was a strangled player. In my vampire LARP, I would often assign new players that were brand new to the yep. game or the genre to an, a more experienced, or someone that suddenly gained reputation for their behavior. Well, guess what? You now have the um, you know, orange. Um, I tend to run a lot of different types of campaigns, different campaign systems and stuff. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've found that makes it really easy for the players themselves is to have a campaign get-together. Home base, base of operations, uh, somebody's hotel room, something of that nature to give them a kind of uh, bonding area where they can actually have something familiar with every single session. They're coming back to a place that they know they've been to. It makes it easy for me to pull the rug out from under them and totally destroy the place if I want to. The one thing um, that I'm trying to see is any kinds of uh, storytelling ideas or cons from that, or uh, bad ideas of not to go and do certain things with that. I, I actually do that with every game I run. Every World of Darkness game, the characters share a, a domain of some kind. Um, was it Rite of Princes for Dark Ages that had yeah. first introduced the rules where you can pull your background? It was it was in it was in Dark Ages Vampire a little bit, and Rite of Princes really expanded on it, and it got adapted into I think all of the twenty lines, right. yeah. as well it should have been, because it's a it's a wonderful idea. It's a shared communal resource that the players all pull into and they all come to. So that's a big reason why it's in every white. Yeah. Game so game like your character game. would offer up two dots of Haven and. Mine would offer two of resources, and Rose's would put in some retainers, and then as a group we would build that, and it becomes a shared resource, which then the storyteller can fuck with if they want to. Um, if you if you don't have a, a, if you don't have a communal space, you could um, have a sort of communal setting or a communal feeling. I ran a lot of Exalted uh, way back in the day, and I uh, Exalted has this concept of a perfect circle, which is five of each. Uh, each type of, one of each type of each five solar exalts. And so theoretically, if you have a perfect circle, you have them covering every conceivable base in the setting, and maybe there's nothing that they cannot do as a group. And I would kind of reinforce this, even though they didn't have a home base, they were traveling all over this massive continent, they would constantly have these like dreams, 
and memories of their prior incarnations, fighting alongside prior incarnations of each other, and doing things with each other, sometimes doing things to each other when they're nice, but they have to deal with in the present day, but you always be reinforcing that, you know, I'm kind of scared. Um, <laughs> kind of reinforcing that communal feeling of we are bonded in a way that kind of goes beyond that. Find a stick help. I've, <laughs> I've actually been to Metagamer at times and it has been very problematic because I um, I've read every World of Darkness book and I have I have an encyclopedia of memory for this sort of thing. And while that makes me a pretty good writer at times on a lot of this online, I'm a shitty player. Because it's like, oh that guy's in a cantrip. Right. Oh, I love this question. I know him. Bam. Right. Oh, you're using that for me being uh, lineage, huh? So I wouldn't have gone with that choice. <laughs> no, I'm terrible. <laughs> and, um, you can ask yes, Tiamat, right? The, the, yeah. The big advantage to the World of Darkness is that both World of Darkness is a very vast and narrative period. And uh, throw a fucking monkey wrench at that jerk. And just just make something up that is completely not within the Malo. And when, it, when they're expecting you to go right, you go left. And keep things guessing, because the other players, they won't know what's going on either. Um, and that's not presupposing you haven't just had a gentle chat with the player out of character, being like, because that's really what the first kind of player conflict should resolve, right? an actual player-player conflict, or an actual SP player conflict. You should start off by having a gentle talk with them in character, out of game, and not in front of the other people, being like, hey man, hey or hey lady, that was kind of not cool, or I don't think we had a really good experience that time. How can we make this better? Or what are your feelings on it? I mean, that's what that's what I usually ask you. Know, like, how do you feel about what happened first? And then I talk about how I felt about it. It's basic conflict resolution. Um, but if that doesn't work, uh, yeah, monkey wrench them and use the vast world of darkness to your advantage and throw something at them that they haven't heard of or it's what they think is, and it's actually something else, even if you just made that something. I will comment specifically on Masquerade here. Um, I run, when I run Masquerade, I tend to assume that the characters have a much greater degree of knowledge of the setting than uh, the core book usually assumes. I find in Masquerade that uh, letting players start with reasonably knowledgeable characters who have seen through some of the bullshit, honestly, helps a lot. It's not always a bad thing. Yeah, when they're like, uh, when they're like, oh, you know, society X doesn't actually believe the thing they're saying to us. They actually believe in the the god of Y. And you're like, there's no fucking way you would know that. Man. Well, Neil but, made two good points. The first would be to have a, an actual grown-up conversation with that player, saying, look, we're doing a game where we're having fun. You, the player, might know this, but your your, your character doesn't. So let's let's resolve that and find a way for both of us to continue having fun. And then, the world of darkness is full of mysteries and people going against stereotypes. So, I had people assuming the Bruja were going to do a certain thing, and it turned out they were all true Bruja. None of the players saw that coming. If you can get your, if you can get your player to, uh, to creatively engage with the metagaming, um, and I'm having a little trouble articulating this, but it's something that uh, I've done usefully before, Sometimes somebody who really wants to bring in the metagame knowledge can be persuaded to do it in a way that's dramatic and in character, um, that plays off the fact, you know, that, that uses the knowledge without necessarily attributing that knowledge to their personal character. Um, yeah. This ties in a lot with Camille's secret thing. Um, yeah, speaking, I, what I did was I gave a, a, a character visions. So every once in a while they would have an insight and then we would spin that into the story. Which can work if your specific issue is uh, if two players are acting against one another and one of them is acting as though his character is aware of it when he shouldn't be. Yeah. You can just roll with it and say, okay, yeah, you, you, you know that. Um, although you don't, rem 
although it has passed from your memory as dreams go, you, you know that because you dreamt it last night, and then you figure out why and, and have them. If they, uh, if, they insist on doing, if they insist on having that kind of knowledge, then, um, yeah, there's always a reason why they could have had it. But I would also pair that with a good... Yeah, chat. first have the grown-up conversation. Yeah. <laughs> if I can jump in with a couple of different thoughts, a great way for uh, throw a monkey wrench into things, let's say they're really, really big masquerade players. Pick up the vampire translation guide and show them <laughs> something from Requiem. <laughs> Yeah. Like, even if it's just the Nosferatu, Requiem's Nosferatu were very different from the Masquerade. Or even, like, go for, like, one of Requiem's rarer bloodlines. Or have a game with that up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if they're really big into classic World of Darkness, throw them something from the New World of Darkness. If they're really big into New World of Darkness, throw them something from classic. It's an easy way just to throw them something really unexpected. They think they know what they're up against, and they really don't. Uh, another thing I wanted to say was um, sometimes you can just take advantage of the fact that they are metagaming and use that. Um, I, I forget which book it was, but it was for the New World of Darkness, I'm pretty sure, where the example they gave was, okay, you know, the party's split into, one of them is like, okay, they're, they've broken into the morgue and they're searching this dead body, and the other one is researching things in a library. And okay, you like this guy is wearing like an, an Irish torque. It's, like, it's got orange caps on the end. So, what are you guys researching in the library? I think we should research what torques are. Like so, neither group is actually talking to one, uh, one another, but they are taking advantage of the fact that as players they know what's going on to speed things up. Yeah. Okay. Bring me back off the side of the coin. Um, with a, such a vast library of products, and the, the very first white book that I bought was green and it was floppy. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of my friends have played forever, a lot of the groups have played forever. I have run into issues whenever you create something new or throw something that hasn't been defined out there, and then you're like, wait a minute. They throw their hands up. I understand they want to start keeping mystery and discovering the forgotten and the other, but then they start to feel as if they have no recourse, or there was no way for them to protect themselves against the threat, or there was no way to. Are you talking about, you're talking about the rap now? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad they're all gone. <laughs> well, not anymore. Yeah. Well, <laughs> neither way, neither way. Yeah, Mr. Jihad diary development. Well, yeah. well, for instance, like um, I, I love when Promethean. Hunter and Geist came out because those immediately gave me an, an ability to look and be like, and they haven't printed crap about this before, you need to shut up and it's all new stuff, right? Yeah, well, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Right, but if I end up, for instance, uh, there's one where I got absolutely decimated on. There's a story about the green, uh, the green people who like uh, suicide force in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, and Immediately, the mages wanted to know why their death magic couldn't fix the thing, or why doesn't the spirit magic fix the thing, or why can't they use this ritual to summon the spirit because they're werewolves? And they want to know. So when you, when you get that to the library, how do you look them dead in the face and you say, "And it doesn't work." Uh, I know you spent XP on it. I know that's what your character does. But no. Well, first of all, you do that very rarely. Yeah. Right. Um, but the other thing. Uh, I uh, got this from a D&D &D book somewhere. It might even have been the uh, third edition uh, DMG. Uh, ask them why. <laughs> Say, yeah. yeah, okay, uh, that's, that's a little odd. What are some theories here? Thanks for credit. Um, and be, because uh, personally, and I, you know, this is not for everybody to say, personally, I love it when, when uh, players speculate in character. Oh my god, they come up with a thousand times worse crap than I could ever throw out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've, I've deleted so many antagonists when the players had a better idea in their random spectrum. Yeah, my ritual does what? Let me take notes. Okay, that, that, sounds, that sounds really good. So you think that's what his plan is? That's way better than what I had. <laughs> that's an awesome plan. Have an XP. You figured it out. Yeah. <laughs> the Randy Corporation, guys, in right. cooperation with the first time, I blame you all for 
or changeling, the new one? Because now, they're always like, it's called the damn changeling thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 it's probably a damn goblin or a changeling. Probably your skin or whatever. You know, it's like everything is like, how do you kill changeling? Can we burn the heads down? Like, it's, 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 I just immediately. Well, that's, you know, a perfect, a that's a perfect opportunity for you to make them think it is a changeling and then bring in a guidance or a promotion. Oh, or something. Or, well, right. They'd be so excited. But no, it's, uh, it, have you ever. Uh, this credit method, or is there any other advice you can give about being like, yes, I know, I'm not trying to screw you over, but this is good. Uh, have well, it, I, I find, and this, this is good advice for mage in general, because uh, it, uh, in, for mage in, especially, because mages have kind of the, the day job of looking into weird stuff that's not caused by the arcana, and they go, but why isn't my death magic working on this? Uh, have it partially work? Like, if the, um, it's not strictly speaking supported by mechanics, but if I was running Werewolf and um, the pack came across a Strix, uh, which should not respond to their, um, to their spirit powers at all, uh, I describe how it nearly works, and, um, and then they can, they can work it out from there. They don't feel entirely cheated if they get some information. Or twist it. Have it work in an unexpected way. And then give them a... Rather than, yeah, rather than make them feel cheated, make them experience. Which is an important skill for mage and not one I have always been good at. So I was wondering uh, what you thought on the line between um, um, a lot of games are made, especially you know things like D&D and more flat plays RPGs now, uh, where the players have all the agency and you know they create their characters, they create their backstories, all that thing together, and then you all go to the table and you play the DM story. Um, and I found that uh, Vampire, especially, but a lot of storytelling games, work best when the uh, when the storyteller is involved in saying, okay, only story is work. Uh, or only, you know, you have to create permitting characters, or create characters that have this goal, or, you know, a lot of, like, hands on, like, create characters, like, I want you to create in the story, and I'll create all the background stuff. And then when the game starts, just let the players do whatever they want, and there's yeah. no, there's no story, except for what the players do. Um, so, where do you guys, uh... Well, I love handing out a campaign premise. Um, best vampire game I ever ran, um, I started out by saying, all right, you two are vampires, you're neonate, one of you knows what's going on, the other doesn't. Decide who it is, and, uh, and then I'm gonna, put, I'm gonna throw you in the deep end. Um, and that worked really well. And in general, um, so in general I approve of your strategy of, um, of providing a premise up front more than trying to put the story in later. The other thing I find is that it helps a lot to, uh, to populate the world with characters with their own agendas that the PCs may or may not run into depending on the choices they make, and then you can just back burner things. Maybe, that maybe they don't not 150 of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. See, um, yeah, actually, uh, uh, <laughs> 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 just there's <laughs> uh, there's a uh, game that I think provides really good. Uh, Advice on this, uh, on the on the building threats and agendas thing, uh, Apocalypse World by Vincent yeah, Baker. Great. Yeah. Um, it's a neat game in general, and and one I uh, one I really love and admire. But one of the things it does is it describes how to create what it calls fronts, which are combination threat agenda kind of things that you just put there in front of the players, and then they decide what to do with them. The um, another good game to show another company's game. Uh, that does very well for that sort of thing is the Dresden Files by Evil Hat. They have a, um, after character creation, they have what's called a city creation. You're not actually literally creating a city. You can't, it's hard for you to create New York when New York is already there. But instead, you're identifying the parts of New York that you want to treat almost as a character. And the setting itself is, the setting and that is involved in engaging with the players. And by actually choosing that and picking the parts of the city they want, the players are more or less telling you what parts of the story that they want to engage in and what you can use to throw at them. Even if it's a sandbox, they're kind of still, they, there's still stuff that they want to engage. 
In my most recent game, I'm um, and this is Legend of the Five Rings, another um, you know another company's game, but I am running in uh, Ryoko Owari, which is known as the City of Lies. It's a very famous old box set by Greg Solding, and although he's done stuff for us and for other companies as well, you could buy anything with his name on it. Definitely. Um, Anything by Greg. Greg, and it's a, it's a huge, massive sandbox, but Greg provides a story within it that is essentially what we're talking about. It's another person's agenda that's kicking into high gear that the players are reacting to until they figure out how to actively take control of it. And actually, on that, my players never reacted to it because they shortcut the entire campaign by basically saying, all right, we want to blow up the opium trade. This guy looks like he's the one who wants to do it the most. Let's go talk to him. And he was the one who was going to start blowing up the opium trade, and they had to react to it until they found out the culprit. And they're like, no, let's help you. Let's, let's burn the city to the ground. Okay, then. <laughs> one of my players has a habit of doing that. He's, uh, he, he, he's become the guy who, um, if, a, uh, if somebody looks like he might be a reoccurring villain building into the villain of the Oval Chronicles, he will just kill him. <laughs> like, he will go out of his way. One of my players once convinced his own evil twin to switch sides. <laughs> the, lo the, the line of bullshit logic that he gave me, I could not deny it would have worked on him. <laughs> so with uh, Masquerade, in spe specifically, I create a style sheet before the game starts where um, I create a, a couple of paragraphs about the city or the concept if it's not going to take place in a specific city. Like I'm running an Alaster game right now, so those characters travel a lot, hunting. I don't know what that is. Uh, um, the Alasters are a special kind of archon that hunts the most wanted villains. They're, they're so bounty they're, hunters. Yeah, the, they, big, the big bad they're, vampires. They're the, okay. they're the internal affairs yeah. of the Camarilla. Um, but they travel a lot from city to city, so I didn't have an actual city domain where this game was going to take place in, because they're going to go from New York to Vegas to London to wherever the threat is. Um, so I, I described that that's the basic concept of the game, but then I introduce a, some of the NPCs I'm going to be using. And I'll talk about this is the Prince of New York, and they're a Ben True, and they do this, and then I'll actually ask questions to the players. I'm like, I'll go to Meredith and I'll say, what happened 20 years ago between your character and the prince to make you hate each other? And I'll do that with uh, several of the different NPCs, and that means the players are thinking about their characters as part of the world. Uh, so I'm getting to know some of their background, and it's giving me plot seeds that I can use during, a, during the game. We actually published a 10,000-word system for this in uh, Requiem 2nd Edition called Climbing the Ladder, which is all about building the world around your characters. It was inspired a lot by the Dresden Files city building. It was also inspired by the character creation in Smallville. By, by that instead of doing something fun. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> if any of you kickstarted Beast, one of the stretch goals for Beast was to write a uh, setting up your chronicle guide. Yeah, it's called Building a Legend. Which, yeah, I'm a little mad about that. <laughs> For Requiem? Uh, Requiem Second Edition. It's available uh, in the booth. Go buy it. Yeah. Uh, it's called Climbing the Ladder. It's in the storytelling section. So it's in the core. And it's lastly, yeah, the core city. City. And lastly, on one. Oh, uh, yeah. Damnation City is an excellent book on building cities. It's also very safe. <laughs> um, but on one last point, there's, with, if running this last campaign has taught me anything, it's that my, player, my players sell equally into one of two groups. One, two of the players were perfectly happy playing in the sandbox all day, flinging sand at one another, and having an hour-long in-character tea party. Basically, a tea ceremony, I'm sorry, it's a samurai. And they were just totally happy doing that with each other, and role-playing the proper gift-giving, and doing that, and really getting into it. The other group of players was like, where are we going next? What are we doing? We're catching the bad guys, we're kicking ass. What are we doing next? Where are we going? And they, wanted, they were so goal-oriented, but the others were just happy to just be there and experience the setting of the world. I live for that kind of thing. My players, Cabal, have a habit of... Um, I, I set up several ongoing uh, mysteries. I even order, get some of the uh, tutors, some of the characters' tutors to order them to look into things. The Cabal go to Trucosaurus, and my players are uh, apparently more happy uh, role-playing the characters' conversation over hot dogs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the game that I've been in for a couple of years, we actually spent multiple sessions 
fixing the house after the house after the house fire created by the elemental. Yeah. We got time for maybe one or two questions. Let's go straight back. There you go. See, <laughs> not just <laughs> there. You go. Primarily, I play bass, but yeah. Um, <laughs> because I do a lot of mixing my flats all together, I like to have things in reserve with the majors and all of them work together. And a lot of it ends up being kind of off the cuff and impromptu. Do you guys have particular things that you do when you're dealing with people with the challenge of the I have done that a fair amount over the years. I wouldn't say it's my default mode of play or anything, but I have done crossover games a fair amount. And um, Usually, I try to tie characters together, when, when that starts to happen, I try to tie them together through things that don't have to do with the magic or the fangs or anything like that. I'm like, oh, remember Susie, the NPC uh, you met three sessions ago? She's got a problem, and she wants your help, and tie the players in sort of via their character's emotional ties. Um, when things start to drift, I always look to my supporting cast. I'm currently running a Geist and Hunter game, so... I've got two guys PCs and two hunter PCs, and they don't get along. But the external mystery of why why there are 500 ghosts on the island of Roanoke when there should be maybe be two is giving them a unified <laughs> mystery that they handle in different ways. And I actually put a lot of the um, the need to support. Hunter's themes on the people playing Hunter and Geist on that. So I actually get a lot of buy-in from the players and I make them actually help me keep the themes that are true to Hunter in as part of the game and same for Geist. So I don't take on all of the responsibility myself. I make the players that want to play these different types of splats really bring the important part of that game to the table. And I think you should, you should definitely still respect the strengths of the splats and be careful when you're constructing challenges of one splat, like as you mentioned, Mage is not easily able to accomplish it. Mage kind of has a weird reputation with crossover games for, for precisely that reason, right. and I've noticed. And people online are like, well, if I have a murder mystery, the mage can just look back in time with one turn and see who did it. And my dismissive answer is, is, is always, well, maybe you shouldn't have built your mystery around that. Jeez. Um, but that is dismissive. But, but it does kind of kick to the core of it that a lot of mage mysteries are not built around the how this is happening, but the why this happens. Why did the garbage can come alive and eat his face off? I don't know. The mage doesn't know. I've kind of set it up to where they just make it post apocalyptic. Everybody in the world is dead except about 20,000 people, and that's it. That's a good game pool. It also means that all the people in the world are dead. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, having them rely on each other and rely on each other's strengths uh, is really the best way to keep them together and keep them playing for that. So we could keep going for another couple hours, but we're just about out of time. A lot of us are going to be spending time at the booth, and we'd love talking about this kind of stuff. So come on down to the booth. Oh yeah, and, uh, storytelling craft is one of my favorite subjects. And if you if you haven't if you haven't uh, sign up for the Onyx Path forums because we're all there too. So. Yeah, and we deal with, uh, the Onyx Path forums um, get some pretty interesting discussions on high-level chronicle management. It's one of the things I think the strength of that community, so definitely come join us. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.